Welcome to the Innovation Storytellers Podcast. We talk to innovators and disruptors in R&D, product managers, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs, innovation thought leaders, and their storytellers who help bring their amazing ideas to life. Now, here's your host, innovation storyteller, CEO, speaker, and coach to the world's top innovation teams, Susan Lindner. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Linder, and I'm your host of Innovation Storytellers. And for the last 20 years, I've been helping innovators and disruptors to tell their stories. 10 acquisitions and hundreds of innovative products and countless hockey stick growth curves in both directions later. I want to share how great innovations get to market and how stories get used along the way to do that. And I'm just beyond thrilled that Edward Roussel is joining us today from Dow Jones. He is the Chief Innovation Officer at Dow Jones, and he is responsible for identifying all the new areas of opportunity with a focus on startups and relationships with Silicon Valley companies. Not an easy thing to uphold these days. So Edward, you joined Dow Jones back in 2013 as the head of digital product development, overseeing all different kinds of projects, including the redesign of the Wall Street Journal's website and its associated apps. But If I have this right, before that, you were with the Telegraph Media Group, and before that, at Bloomberg, one of the journal's biggest competitors. So I'm so excited to have you on today and to talk about not just the innovations that you're bringing to the fore, but the stories that you use to get that innovation through the sausage factory that is corporate life. So welcome, welcome. I'm just so excited to have you on today. Well, thank you for having me, Susan, and it's great to be here. So, you know, my first question starts off with, you know, just the process of being in media. And I think a lot of people expect our news to just magically keep up with the state of innovation, right? That we should just, our newspaper should magically transform into a website, should magically transform into an app, because on some level, we're all news junkies. But the reality is, you're really at the cutting edge of how we receive information every day and you're really help making us see the world in a new way through the technologies that you use. So how do you begin the process of just saying to yourself, what's the next frontier? How do you begin the ideating and the planning process around that? Well, Susan, the first observation I think is to look at the past and see what's happened and look at the trajectory of the past and to try to learn from what's happened in the sort of 25 plus years of the digital revolution and how it's impacted the news industry. And if you go all the way back to the dawn of time in terms of the web for news companies, obviously the web's existed for a while, but news companies started to put stories on websites about 25 years ago. In fact, the uh, WSJ.com is about to have its 25th anniversary in the month of April. Um, So let's call it 25 years. What happens um, in the first stage is media companies attempted to recreate newspaper front pages on websites. And if you look at those early website designs, design might be a bit too grandiose a term. It essentially attempted to replicate the front page of a newspaper both in terms of the story ordering, the headlines, the abstracts, little blocks of text interspersed across uh, web pages. Then about 12 years ago, mobile exploded, in particular with the launch of uh, the iPhone. And media companies then had this second challenge, which is how do you kind of translate that content into very small screens? Then at the same time, we had other revolutions. We had the introduction of social media, which had a very disruptive force on the news industry. And how do you then distribute that content across, across those networks? And more recently, we've had you know, significant innovation around uh, podcasting and audio. And you know, if you look across you know, all of those experiences, typically what happens is media companies try to take the old model and shoehorn it into the new technology interface. So with the beginning of the web, the attempt was to kind of shoehorn news content into a web page, and then with, with mobile to shoehorn web content into mobile pages. Every time we do this, what we realize is that technology forces you to think again about how you're telling stories and really to have the how adapted to the new medium. 
So I think what we learned with the web eventually is that the experience of the web was very different from newspapers because, of course, it was 24-7. It was 24-7 and it was visual, whereas you know, newspapers typically once a day. And, you know, visuals are important, but not as important as they are on the web. So the 24-7 nature of the web made that form of storytelling very different. And over time, you'll see that newspapers went from you know, publishing once a day on the web to publishing multiple times across the day. You know, similar story with mobile. And again, the attempt was to shoehorn web content into a mobile interface. But then what we learned is that consumption habits on mobile were very different than the web. Notably, that the amount of time people spend reading on mobile is very short. You know, you might pick up your phone. People on average pick up their phones and look at their phones 100 plus times a day. But it's for very short periods of time, on average, about three minutes. And so you have this new challenge, which is how do you give people a great reading experience in bite-sized chunks of just three minutes? Then you kind of fast forward to the present day and the revolution that's currently underway with audio. And again, you know, what publishers ideally want is to be efficient. And so to, in other words, be able to have, you know, the same people who do, who write stories, you know, talking about stories on podcasts. But what we were learning, as with our discussion today, is that the ability to tell stories well through audio devices like podcasting is very different. So all that to say, Susan, that with every new technology, we're having to rethink storytelling. And that's a very important lesson from the past 25 years. So as we look to the future, we don't want to replicate that mistake of thinking that we can simply take what we've got and somehow sort of package it up a little bit and then sort of you know, distribute it in new formats. And I think there's going to be a number of ways in which storytelling will change in the coming years. And some of these ways we already know to be the case. So we know, for example, that the visuals are becoming far more important. In an era of Instagram, being able to tell stories in a visual way is going to become far more important. It is already important. It's going to be far, going to be far more important. And does that mean great photography? Does that mean more infographics and interactive charts? Or what, what does that look like when you say more visual? All of the above. It means mm -hmm. um, sequences of photographs, with videos, and interactive graphics. But I think the key difference, and this is important, the key difference is the way that media companies currently operate is those are three distinct and separate things. So you've got, you've got, you typically have video teams, you have photo departments, you have interactive teams. In the future, in the not-too-distant future, all of those media are going to converge into a single experience. So you'll see sequences that kind of evolve in a very natural way from photography to video to interactive graphics, and it becomes one thing. And you look at some of the examples that you're currently seeing, you know, there's some great examples maybe competitive from the New York Times in terms of recreating some of the tragic events of 2020, you know, the, the death of George Floyd and Armand Arbery, and how media organizations recreated what happens at those events. And if you look at the best of them, it's some composite of all of those three, some composite of photography, of video and graphics. And it's really a new form of storytelling season. I think that's what's exciting about it. In the current world, those three visual media are run separately. In the future world, it'll be about knitting them, stitching them together into one single narrative. So I think that's one very fundamental change is the visual storytelling and how it combines photography and video and interactive graphics. The second is audio. It's just a stunning fact that Apple sold 100 million pairs of AirPods in 2020, 100 million. So wow. uh, whether you're on your mobile phone and listening or whether you're, or you've got a smartphone in your home or whether you've got Apple CarPlay or Android Auto in your car. So whether you're in the home or in the car or out and about on your mobile phone, we've now got this very powerful audio listening devices. And so I think the second area to look at very closely is the revolution in audio and where that's taking us. And, you know, currently it's very much podcast focused. But I suspect that that's going to kind of mutate and change quite significantly. And there'll be a whole variety of new listening experiences that are going to come um, to the fore. And I think the third and final way area to look at is how AI changes storytelling. Now, when you discuss that, it scares people a little bit because they think, well, you know, are the robots going to be taking over? But I think you want to think a little bit more simply. You know, what are the, some of the problems that AI can solve? So, for example, can you use AI technology to serve you hyperlocal news, for example, in the way that you're seeing apps like Citizen or Nextdoor used quite effectively. So being very smart in the application of AI to solve some very specific problems. So I think visuals, 
audio, AI, and these are the technologies going to shape the media of the future. Yeah, it's fascinating because I have become an audible fanatic and I'm an audio book nut. And I will have two or three audiobooks going at the same time, depending on my mood. I will go for a walk and I will listen to a podcast. And then I will come back to my desk and I will jump on Clubhouse and I will either host a room or I'll participate in a room. And so I find myself playing with all these different audio formats all the time, not to mention hosting a podcast. But (laughs) that kind of interaction, I now find that when... I really want to read a piece or I really want information quickly. I don't necessarily have the tolerance for the reading anymore that I used to. And my desire is to multitask all the time. I want to obtain information and I want to consume information while in the midst of other things. And I, my attention span is probably whittling down to about zero at this point. Well, but it's very you- hard now for me to do something without audio in the background educating me. I think the interesting thing, Susan, is that when you think about the future media, just look at your own consumption habits, exactly what you've just said, which Mm -hmm. is, you know, for good or for bad, we're in the multitasking generation. And one of the interesting facets of Clubhouse is it embraces that. And in effect, it's like a sampling media. You can dip in and out of multiple rooms until you find a room where there's a conversation that you want to take part in. And I think people initially were a bit uncomfortable about that. When you're hosting a show on Clubhouse, it can be a little bit off-putting as people kind of joining and leaving and joining and leaving. But actually, once you get used to it, it makes a lot of sense. And that's the way that our minds operate. I think the same is true of listening. I listen to The Economist, for, for example, in the gym once a week. That and means you, you listen to-, to The Economist once a week or you only go to the gym once a week? How does that, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> I try to go more often, but I only listen to The Economist once. But, gotcha. but, the, but the interesting thing about that is since it's entirely substitute my reading behavior, I no longer read The Economist. I only listen mm-hmm. to it. And so I think, you know, you quite rightly frame it the right way, Susan, which is that a lot of, a lot of these technologies enable is to multitask, is to skim, is to gather information in small bite-sized chunks. Um, as a related point, I learned from Snapchat that, you know, if you look at the Discover platform on Snapchat, the average amount of time that the user on Snapchat will spend reading, quote unquote, an edition from a particular publication is 80 seconds. And what they're doing is they're skimming through the photographs and the captions and they're reading the photos and the captions. They're not reading the text. So it's that kind of that action of skimming between photographs, picking up photographs and captions, photographs and captions but not necessarily reading the text. So these are challenging changes to the way that we tell stories. And of course, you know, the big picture is the battle for human intention has never been greater. But you know what, at the same token, like as I'm contemplating this and I was like, yes, that's exactly right. I want my stuff short, sweet and delivered beautifully into my, you know, with good sound. And I love NPR for the attention and the detail they take to the actual sound production and the quality of that. But on the other side, if Seth Abramson is putting out a thread about some kind of theory about what's happening in you know, the previous White House, I will read all 141 of his tweets in that thread because he's taken the Netflix approach to make me watch the next episode, you know, knock it off the couch. I need to keep scrolling. I need to know that next fact. So when I think about that kind of threading as an innovation, it's really just a blog, isn't it? But because it comes in little pieces of popcorn, I can't stop eating it. <laughs> I have to have it. Right. And, you know, I think that just to be clear, I think that there is still enormous appetite for deep immersive pieces. So typically, if you ask a subscriber to Vanity Fair, you know, what is the memorable pieces? They'll probably you know, mention no more than you know, a couple of pieces that they've read over the past 12 months. But those couple of pieces will be extremely memorable. And so I think a lot of the, if you like, snacking and sampling of content is just to keep you informed and up to speed. But I think that there's still that incredible human need to immerse yourself in a very deep read or a Netflix series or something that's a bit more immersive. It's how those two experiences coexist that's, I think, important. So, Edward, how did you get into the innovation game? And do you have like 
a deep love of newspapers based on, I'm assuming this accent comes with a side of fish and chips as well. Like, is this <laughs> <laughs> newspaper wrapped glory? And that's where the love of newspapers came from, or how did this happen for you? Well, I think it's simply a question of being curious. And when you're curious, I think you, you're not afraid to ask dumb questions. It's like, how does this work? And what does this mean? And I was a journalist in the previous life, but I found myself, you know, at the beginning of the, of the web, getting more and more interested about how the web was changing uh, media consumption habits. And then particularly with the dawn of apps, begin to think, oh my gosh, this is really very fundamental change in how people are consuming news. And then asking all the dumb questions. Well, how does one build a website? What does it mean to have a good experience reading news on the web? And how does an app work? And what do people really want out of an app? And I think it's my key bit of advice for anyone who's interested in being innovative, pretty in any field, is a very simple thing to be curious and just ask all the dumb questions. How does this work? How could it be better? And I think when you go down that path, you learn an awful lot. And what you also learn is there's no such thing in some of these emerging fields as deep expertise. So everybody's learning. And so the real question is, are you going to throw yourself into it or not? And I think there's a lot to be said for particularly with emerging technologies, for just throwing yourself into it and just trying it and just seeing whether, you know, whether it works and not being afraid if it doesn't work out. Time. Let's talk about the not working out part, because all of my guests have been very kind and been quite vulnerable about the places where it doesn't work. And, you know, we were talking with a guest from Tesla who was the guy who threw the steel snowball at the glass on the new Tesla pickup truck and watched it shatter in front of millions of people, right? So he still has that steel snowball and brought it on the show, which was terrific. But number one, how do you push innovation through an organization as esteemed as Dow Jones, where people are craving what is happening on Wall Street? That Wall Street Journal font is epic, iconic. You would hate to even think about changing it. How do you begin to move progress or make changes internally? And what does it look like when things don't go right? So let me take the second question first. What does it look like when things don't go right? You know, I think anybody who is curious and wants to push boundaries is going to make mistakes or you're going to get things that are wrong. And you need to be okay with that. You need to be okay with the idea that you may have this brilliant idea, but when you put it in front of customers, they'll tell you it's not brilliant. (laughs) <laughs> and you need to be sufficiently <laughs> humble. So I think that's the first thing is that you need to be comfortable with the idea that many things that you try aren't going to make it. And there's a culture at Dow Jones that allows you to say it's not going to make it. Here's here's a half million dollars. Go invest in some cool new apps, some cool new technology. And if it dies, so be it. There is. And, you know, I have done that and I'm still alive. Of course, it doesn't have to be half a million dollars. And I think that is an important point, Susan. And I think that one of the things that has changed significantly in recent years is the cost of prototyping and testing has come right down. And so actually, you don't need to spend half a million dollars to figure out whether an idea makes sense or not. So I think if I look at Sometimes I've become too emotionally attached to an idea or concept, and I've been reluctant to let it go. So, for example, I, you know, with some of my colleagues, I built an app. It's called What's News, and it kind of harks all the way back to the famous column on, on the front page of the newspaper um, called What's News, which was created by a, br- a very brilliant editor, you know, back in the 1940s called Barney Kilgore. And we were thinking, wouldn't it be great to create an app that just told you the here and now news you need to know through the day? And so we built an app. It was very beautiful. It worked really well. It did the job really well. But you know what? We couldn't get customers to adopt it. And I think what I learned from that is it's confusing to have two apps in the app store. You know, the people, you end up with that conundrum, which is, well, which app should I read? And it was unclear to consumers which app you need, you should, you should read. So all that to say that whilst there was a kernel of a good idea there, we somehow didn't execute it quite right, and we eventually kind of shut it down. So that's just an example of one of numerous mistakes that I've made along the way. But every time you make a mistake like that, you learn something from it. And usually the, the painful lessons are the most valuable lessons. So, for example, from that particular episode, I learned the enormous barrier that exists to download a new app. And also the barrier to having more than one app in the marketplace is it divides marketing revenue. It confuses consumers. So you you learn lessons from it in, in the process. In terms of leaning in, I think the number one lesson I'd say to people is 
think about prototyping and testing uh, and really leaning into prototyping and testing and doing it at the lowest possible cost. So it's much better to come up with a very quick concept, a, a clickable prototype, put it in front of you know, 50 to 100 consumers, get feedback, get a signal, and then move on. So the, if the signal is positive, okay, you've got a nice problem on your hands, which is what do you do with it next? If the signal is negative, move on very quickly because no one's going to fault you for trying. And by the way, if you work for a company that is going to fault you for trying, then you should probably go and find another job. If you're in innovation, but, but, absolutely. <laughs> but no, in any progressive company, no one's going to fault you for trying. I think that's really important. And no one's going to fault you for following a disciplined process where you're very clear on the pain point that you're trying to solve for. You come up with a concept, you build out some sort of prototype, and you test it independently with, with people who can sort of look at it with a, a cool and dispassionate eye and see the results independently, maybe from your own. That, that's probably important. And so I think that process has become far better understood over the past sort of you know five to 10 years, and also a lot cheaper. So, you know, the process that you go through is not just working internally at Dow Jones to get things approved, but also working with a ton of startups. And we specifically called out Silicon Valley, but I'm assuming you're not geographically bound by where any great idea in the media lives. Yeah. So tell us how that startup to grown up relationship works and how do you make sure that the big behemoth that is Dow Jones doesn't crush the little guy in the process with lots of, you know, criteria and restrictions or maybe localization or tech or security. How do you make sure that doesn't happen? Well, that can happen. I think realistically, it can happen in any organization. You have to, if you like, protect uh, embryonic ideas. And you have to see them as something that's kind of precious and but also vulnerable. And there's always in any organization, I think there's going to be an element of the not invented here syndrome. Well, this is something new. This is a different approach. Why do we need it? Mm. And you need to be prepared to confront that in a constructive way to say, you know, yes, but you know, you, you've got a point, but, but let's give it a try anyway. And so I think how you manage relationships around the organization is incredibly important. So you just got to be, you just got to recognize that's part of the job. It's not enough to have a great idea, to have the skills to prototype it and test it. You've also, you know, like any startup, frankly, you've got to be persuasive with the people around you. This is something that's that, that's worth sponsoring. And to be candid, um, Susan, even if you're a standup, even if you're a startup not within an organization, you know, you've got to have those sell side skills as well. You know, you've got to be able to stand up and uh, project yourself in front of an audience and be an ambassador for your idea and your product. And the best CEOs or startups have typically got very those very strong communication skills as well. This is why I started this podcast, right, is what are the actual stories that need to get told in order for that startup technology, that new incredible idea to make its way through the sausage factory and still come out on the other end as a viable product. So if you think about the last innovation that you were introducing into the Dow Jones family, can you give us a, an idea of some of the storytelling, that influence and persuasion that you might have used? And you know, I, I want to share that one of my guests, Nicolas Bry from Orange in France, he brings ideas from Africa back to the mothership in Paris. And when mm. I asked him, how do you sell these ideas, you know, from countries that your senior executives have never been to with ideas that may sound you're know, completely out of the ordinary for a telecom company, like turning your telecom company into a bank for the unbanked of, you know, Central Africa? <laughs> how does that work? And he said, create innovation and I said, <laughs> I don't think I have heard a more French thing in my life than to know yeah. that you must seduce your senior executives into the idea of a great innovation. And I'm curious if a, if an Englishman such as yourself would agree <laughs> with your with your French compatriot across the way. Well, I love your French <laughs> accent, Susan. And I love yeah, the, and horrible, I love horrible, horrible. <laughs> but, but no, but yes, there, there is an element of seduction, and there is an element of, of selling your idea into an organization, and. And sometimes that's easier than another occasion. So to give you an example, you know, a year ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, our events business just disappeared overnight. In other words, we had a physical events uh, business, CO Council, WSJ Tech, a whole collection of really wonderful events, you know, the future of everything. But the whole joy of these events was that they were in-person events. You could go there, you could hear some ins inspirational speakers, you could then meet people who, you know, interested in the same themes. 
these events in some ways are celebrations. They're celebrations of particular themes. There's the getting together. And, you know, people are social creatures. And so these events for our community were incredibly important. And obviously because of the pandemic, they just disappeared overnight. And that was not only tough for subscribers, but it's tough for us as, as producers. And so we, my team led an initiative, which was really trying to figure out how we digitize the business overnight. So business that was physical, how do we digitize it? And so in that particular instance, there was less of a need to kind of sell it into the organization because we had no choice. And there's a lot to be said for innovating in places where you have no choice. It's got to happen. And so, you know, we tested more than 50 different platforms. We took a big step back and said, well, what are the problems that an event solves? You get, why do you go to an event? What are the user mm-hmm. cases? And of course, what you find is there's complexity in answering that question. Yes, you want to learn something, but you also want to network, you might want to sell something. So there's four or five different user cases for why you might go to a particular event. And then we began to think, okay, well, how can we recreate those digitally? And the long and the short of it is, we were able to, you know, more than salvage events business. We were able to, to, uh, to turn a year that started really, really badly and into a year that's actually been very successful and that continues to be kind of successful. And a lot of the sponsorship money has come back in, right. you know, paying attendance has come back, has, has, has returned. And I think that there's a long-term benefit, which is that as the pandemic eases, you know, the events business will be some hybrid of digital and in person, and we're well set up for that. So that's, if you like, an example of, I think, a, a successful innovation project, but one that was done very collaboratively, working you know, hand in glove with our events business, and it was born out of necessity. And I think both those things are very important. I think you, know, you never want to do an innovation project where it's in a kind of a corner of the office. It's always got to be a collaboration with colleagues. And then ideally, you feel that kind of urgency to create something that's fresh and new. So I think that's one user case. I think another user case that was that didn't quite have the same degree of urgency was when we we, we created a business called Radical, which does deep research. Um, it's a standalone company that exists today that, that does deep research on on startups, on you know the startup economy. And one of the great things about America is it remains the home of startups, you know, worldwide, the worldwide headquarters of startups. But one of the challenges is it's hard to know who do you invest in, who do you partner with, because in every single sector of the economy, there are dozens and dozens of startups. And so, you know, the problem that we're trying to solve is how do you know which are the best startups in any particular corner of the economy? And the long and the short of it is that we ended up creating a business that helped solve that problem. So I think that certainly, and with that particular example, the first example around events, it was very much integral to the company. The second one, we set it up as a standalone and separate company. It remains a separate and standalone company because it felt like something that was a little bit tangential to what we were doing. So all that to say, um, Susan, I think that there are different approaches and there isn't sort of one single approach to necessarily advocate. But I think, you know, probably the key is to think about some of the bigger, naughtier problems that the company's got and to try to ho- focus on those. The naughtier problems? The naughtier. Um, naughtier. <laughs> maybe <laughs> naughtier <it>. as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are more challenging, that's for sure. So when you think of your innovation platform, as you look out into 2021 and beyond, do you take a portfolio approach where you say, okay, you know, I have to, out of, you know, the eight projects we'll be working on this year, you know, at least 80% have got to work and 20% are going to be, 10% are going to be 50-50, they might make it. And maybe just, you know, one of those projects is a moonshot idea that could completely change the business. How do you look at your innovation roadmap? The reality is that media companies, at least the ones I've worked on, aren't as well organized as you are, they're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always kind of an element of, um, there's also always an, there's this kind of combustibility about media companies and there's always an explosion of ideas. And I think, you know, what, what, if you're a creative thinker, you have to be able to kind of look through that and think about some of what are the significant trends that you want to be exploring. And, you know, what are the significant consumer pain points that you can help solve for and really start there? I think one of the challenges is that at an early stage, you don't always know how big an opportunity something is. So for example, you know, creating a digital events business, we didn't know whether that would you know, add $1 million or $2 million or $20 or $30 or $40 million to, to the bottom line when we got going. All we really knew is it's a problem that needs to be solved and that if we didn't solve it, we'd been having zero revenue. 
And if we did solve it, it'd be something more than zero revenue. So it's not always clear, I think, at the early stages what the size of the prize is. And, you know, that's where good judgment is really needed. And you have to have some sense of, you know, the scale of the pain point that you're trying to address. But you can sometimes overthink that as well. And you'd always see these charts. You mentioned the hockey stick charts. You'll also also inevitably in those decks, you'll see the total addressable market chart. And it's always a very big number. And But the practical reality is that most innovation doesn't really work that way. I think the practical reality, it starts with recognizing a very well-articulated customer pain point and almost working back from that. Even just that single act of articulating a pain point is a great starting point. And then gut checking it, going and speaking to the 20 smartest people that you know, hey, how big a problem do you think this is? And working back from that. And I think that's where innovation becomes exciting because it's something where you know the customer pain points, you're doing some validation of the customer pain point, you commit to prototyping, but at a low price and then testing it, and then you build out from there. It's so fascinating because we become obsessed with the customer experience, right? And rightly so. I mean, they're the ones who are putting cash in our pockets. What's fascinating to me about it is that it's how we go about it. And I was talking to the creator of the Swiffer and he was sharing with me that, you know, that invention in its own right was an incredible breakthrough, but the way different cultures absorbed that breakthrough was very different. So whereas a user in America was very interested in getting their house cleaned quickly, that same approach taken in Italy said, get your house clean in five minutes. It turned out that the average Italian woman was spending about three hours cleaning her home and took pride in that and the cleanliness of her home. So speed actually meant still filthy. Interesting. And, and the cultural implication, and as an anthropologist, naturally, this is what gets me going. But yeah. figuring out the customer pain point is the starting point. But identifying exactly how we express that, yes, you get your house clean, but guess what? It's even cleaner than it could have been the old way of doing things. And so figuring out the priority order of those messages is just almost as important as figuring out the pain point. And as you say, Susan, not assuming that the pain point is ubiquitous, right? It may be specific to America or specific to a different country. And, you know, in, in media, you know, reading habits are not the same worldwide, You know, Japan and India still have a culture of, you know, print newspapers that's quite significant. And so, you know, the transition to digital may take a different path to that of the US and European countries where there's been an acceleration of digital media. So being mindful of culture and cultural differences and therefore how pain points might be different from one country to the next. Yeah. And in a place like New York, you always have a reminder because you might have a, I mean, for breakfast and Turkish food for lunch and Chinese for dinner. Like it's always around you thinking about that milieu. So all of my guests, when they come on, I ask them the same three questions. And I'm kind of curious about yours as I put you on the innovation storyteller hot seat. So Mm -hmm. if I had to ask you, what's been your favorite innovation that you've observed out in the wilds of innovation country out in the world over any time period, now, when you know, historically, whatever, what innovation impresses you the most? What's your favorite? Well, well, that's a tough question. And my answer may not be an original one, but I think it's an important one, which it is the Tesla car. And what I love about that specifically is that the incumbents, in this case, General Motors, should have been the company to invent the electric car and should have been at the forefront. But unfortunately, two decades ago, it killed its electric car, you know, under pressure from the oil industry, under pressure from its own executives who worried about it meant for the legacy combustion engine business. And so they opened the door for Tesla, you know, so they shut down that project in about 2000 and 2003, Tesla launched and fast forward to the current day and Tesla's worth more than uh, the rest of the car industry worldwide combined. And I think, you know, it's just a salutary reminder of what happens if you refuse to innovate, if you, if bureaucrats within your organization gain the upper hand, 
and they persuade people that you know you don't the world is not going to move forward and that you can stay with your existing business model and everything will be fine it, but it, and then on the positive side it shows that capitalism is still working that uh, somebody like Elon Musk can come in and see the opportunity see a significant pain point which is the world is not going to tolerate you know combustion engines forever it's terrible for the environment um, it's terrible for human health and it was able to kind of make something as impactful as he has which of course now is being copied by every other car maker in the world. So I think that to me has been the most dramatic innovation I've seen in the past 20 years. And if you could have participated in the innovation team with any innovation out there, what would you have liked to personally work on given the opportunity? I think the testing phase. So testing with early adopters and getting their feedback and understanding what they like about it, what they don't like about it, and what their fears are. And so really being able to get into the head of early adopter consumers, which are you know very interesting cohort. I think there is another question, which is what could one have done, if anything, at General Motors in 2000? You know, when there's this enormous pressure to shut down the EV1. And what is the narrative that one would have spun that could have persuaded the executives to stick with it? And how hard did people fight for that project? And is there anything else they could have done to preserve it? Because in terms of, you know, calamitous decisions, it's right up there with, you know, Kodak's decision not innovate faced with the disappearance of um, film and cameras. Yeah. And an innovation you'd love to see happen. If you imagine this futuristic world of something you'd love to see come to the fore, what would that be? I think the number one issue for all of us is the environment and what we're doing to the environment. Mm -hmm. And that's a complex topic and it covers a lot of ground. And, you know, it's encouraging that, you know, we've got the, that the Paris Accord is back on track and that there's a very significant conference that's going to take place in November. But I'd love to see uh, more innovation around air quality. And I'd love to see more innovation around uh, preserving our oceans, Mm because this is ultimately our legacy. This is something that we have a responsibility for. And, you know, I think too much of the innovation has been, you know, human centric. And we now need to have innovation that's really around protecting our planet. And that's going to be where the most valuable innovation takes place over the next 10 years. Well, if you haven't seen Seaspiracy yet on Netflix, have you? I'm afraid I have. Well, actually, I'm glad that I have. Mm -hmm. And everybody should watch it. Yeah. What an eye opener to learn that the oceans are as vital to our carbon reduction as the Amazon is. I had absolutely no idea. And so just fascinating. Well, I hope you get to work on those projects in addition to creating incredible journalism and incredible stories of innovation and producing that next new way that we're going to consume media. So thank you so much for joining us today, Edward. I really appreciate your insights. Thank you, Susan. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. (laughs) Likewise. Take care. This innovation story has ended, but yours is just beginning. Go to innovationstorytellers.com, download the free innovation storytelling blueprint, and sign up to pre-order Susan's book, Innovation Storytelling. Get the resources, runway, and recognition you deserve due out this spring. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Until the next innovation story.